If you look at the bottom of the ECG readout, you will see a long run of recording from lead 2. This is called the rhythm strip. We use the rhythm strip to calculate the heart rate and to diagnose abnormal cardiac rhythms. Lead 2 is used as the rhythm strip as it is the easiest lead in which to see P waves. And as we'll see in subsequent sections, identifying P waves is the key to interpreting rhythm disturbances on an ECG. For now, let's deal with the calculation of heart rate. ECG recording paper is divided into large squares, five millimeters wide. And these large squares are in turn further subdivided into small squares, each of one millimeter in width. For our present purposes, we can consider that in all ECG machines, the recording needles run at a constant speed over the ECG paper of 25 millimeters per second. If you think about it, you will realize that this means that distance on the ECG paper equates to time. At a recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, five large squares are covered in one second. So, 300 large squares represents one minute. Therefore, the number of R waves in 300 large squares is the heart rate in beats per minute. Look at the rhythm strip on this ECG. There is one R wave present to every five large squares. So in 300 large squares, there will be 60 R waves present. This patient's heart rate is therefore 60 beats per minute. Generalizing, we found a simple method for calculating heart rate from an ECG. Identify two R waves on the rhythm strip count the number of large squares between them, then take this number and divide it into 300. Provided the heart rhythm is regular, this method gives you an accurate heart rate in beats per minute. In some cardiac arrhythmias, which we will discuss later, the heartbeat is not regular, and in fact, in many normal hearts, as illustrated here, the heart rate is somewhat irregular due to a phenomenon termed sinus arrhythmia. You will remember from physiology that this is a completely normal variant with the heart rate slowing during expiration and speeding up during inspiration. We cannot use the RR interval technique to calculate heart rate in this case. When calculating the heart rate from an ECG in the presence of an irregular rhythm, count out 30 large squares now remembering that five large squares equates to one second, 30 large squares corresponds to six seconds. Count the number of R waves in these 30 squares. In this case, there are seven. Seven beats in six seconds gives a heart rate of 70 beats per minute. In addition to calculating heart rate, the fact that distance on the ECG paper equates to time allows us to use the readout to time the duration of the major events of the cardiac cycle. We've seen that at a standard recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, five large squares corresponds to one second. Therefore, one large square corresponds to one fifth of a second and one small square to 0 0.04 seconds. There are a few numbers coming up now which you simply must learn. In a normal heart, the time between the onset of atrial depolarization, the beginning of the P wave, and the onset of ventricular depolarization, the beginning of the QRS complex, varies between 0 0.12 and 0 0.2 seconds, or between 3 and 5 small squares. This is the PR interval and is largely determined by the physiological delay of the depolarization wave in the AV node and transit in the bundle of His. We'll learn later that many important disorders are associated with alterations in the PR interval. The next key value you need to learn is the duration of the QRS complex.
This represents the time taken for ventricular depolarization to be completed. The conducting system of the ventricles is a highly specialized tissue specifically designed to transmit the depolarization wave rapidly around the ventricles. With an intact conducting system, ventricular depolarization is complete within 0.12 seconds, or three small squares. Hence, a normal QRS complex is equal to or less than three small squares in width. You will learn later in this course that the width of the QRS complex is absolutely central to the ECG interpretation of life-threatening arrhythmias. You must remember this number. Finally, the duration of ventricular repolarization is crucially important in clinical practice. The time between the onset of ventricular depolarization and the end of ventricular repolarization, that is the beginning of the QRS complex and the end of the T wave on the ECG, is termed the QT interval. When the heart rate is 60 beats per minute, the upper limit of normal for the QT interval is 0 0.44 seconds, or 11 small squares. It is important to realize, however, that the measured QT interval varies with heart rate, becoming shorter as the heart speeds up. Therefore, at higher heart rates, it is possible to miss an underlying prolonged QT interval. The discussion which follows may seem academic, but it is very important clinically. Abnormally slow ventricular repolarization places patients at risk of fatal arrhythmias when treated with certain commonly used drugs. The ability to identify prolonged QT in these patients can lead to the use of alternative medications and avoidance of sometimes fatal arrhythmias. When faced with an ECG with a heart rate other than 60 beats per minute, to calculate the true underlying QT interval, referred to as the corrected QT interval, we use the formula shown on the screen. The corrected QT interval is equal to the observed QT interval divided by the square root of the RR interval measured in seconds. This sounds horrendous, but in practice it's pretty straightforward. Let's try and calculate the corrected QT on this ECG readout. In this case, with three large squares between R waves, the patient's heart rate is 100 beats per minute. We select a QT interval on the ECG readout and find that it is eight small squares in duration, or 0.32 seconds. We then look at the preceding RR interval and find that at three large squares, it is 0.6 seconds in duration. The corrected QT interval is therefore 0.32 divided by the square root of 0.6. This computes at 0.41 seconds and is within our upper limit of 0.44 seconds. So this patient does not have prolonged QT. To give you a simple rule of thumb, when you look at the rhythm strip on an ECG, if the observed QT interval is more than half the RR interval, at least consider the possibility of prolonged QT. The importance of the normal values outlined in this video will become increasingly obvious as we discuss the ECG in disease states. Memorize these normal values. The PR interval, three to five small squares. The QRS complex duration, no more than three small squares. And the QT interval, less than 11 small squares at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, and approximately less than half the RR interval at higher heart rates.